It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Opposition leader and president of the National Assembly in Venezuela, also known as the self-proclaimed president, Juan Guaido. He recently reversed his stand on negotiations and now suggests that he is willing to come to the table. Also last week, representative of both the government and of the opposition met with the government of Norway in Oslo to discuss a possible dialogue between the two sides. However, no direct negotiations seem to have taken place as yet. Also, in a rather surprising turn, Trump's special envoy on Venezuela, Elliot Abrams, recently said in a public forum at the Atlantic Council that Maduro's political party, the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, should be a part of any future arrangement in Venezuela. Let's listen. There are no uh, special rights uh, for any political party. I mean, that's the problem today. There are special rights for the PSU, but in a free Venezuela, <clears throat> there just has to be a competition of ideas. Um, people have to, in free elections, which will, which will come, uh, people just have to make their arguments to the Venezuelan people. Uh, and uh, there will be you know, an election, and then there'll be a second election, and a third election, and a fourth election. So I would say you know, um, there's nothing in that sense special about the, the PSUV or the role of the Chavistas. Their, their role is to act as a democratic political party and try to win votes. Previously, Elliot Abrams, along with Guaido, had always insisted that the only solution is that Maduro's government to resign, step aside, leave the country. Joining me now to discuss these latest developments in Venezuela is Tamir Porras. Tamir is a former chief of staff to Nicolas Maduro, then uh, who Nicolas Maduro was President Chavez's foreign minister. He currently teaches at the University of Sciences Po in Paris. Tamir, very good to have you here with us today. Thanks for having me, Sharon. Tamir, previously, Mr. Guaido had rejected negotiations with the government, even when the Pope had suggested that he needed two willing parties to negotiate. Uh, then Guaido insisted that President Maduro only had one option, that was to resign immediately, that he was not interested in negotiations with the Pope or otherwise. So, Tamir, what has changed? Why is Guaido willing to come to the table now? Well, what has changed is that the Venezuelan reality has been, you know, um, harder than what uh, Guaido and his allies uh, thought. Let's remember that in January, when the self-proclamation of uh, Juan Guaido as interim president or so-called interim president happened, uh, the assumption was that the, uh, the uh, evolution, if you will, the uh, curse of events in Caracas, meaning from their perspective, a regime collapse would happen within hours, days, or weeks, uh, but not four months. So uh, everybody in, in, in the Venezuelan opposition and, and probably in the United States was assuming that the international endorsement given to Juan Guaido was going to trigger a series of events internally uh, that were going again to deliver political change, and that has not happened. And and if we if we you know come to the more more recent events, uh, those of April the thirtieth, you know the uh, um, uh, military uprising coup, you know the failed attempt of uh, Mr. Juan Guaido and his uh, you know, former leader or leader of his party, Leopoldo Lopez, uh, calling uh, the Venezuelan military to join them and, 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 and basically generate that regime uh, collapse that they were expecting since January. Um, I mean, the, the, the massive failure of this attempt, um, the, the improvisation uh, shown by you know, the main leaders of this movement, um, the uh, again the uh, the uh, non-existent reaction from the military and 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 again all the 
very, very um, amateurish well, um, action that, that both Mr. Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez led, uh, basically it generated a crisis of uh, credibility in the, uh, in the leadership of the opposition and had everybody, you know, from the United States to the different parties in the Venezuelan opposition and in the international community, uh, wondering whether again this this strategy was sustainable. So I, I think that again the the uh, for those of us who in Venezuela have been advocating from the beginning uh, for a political Venezuelan sovereign uh, negotiated uh, resolution of the crisis, I think the you know the reality within the country showed that that uh, basically this is the only the only way uh, forward. And and finally. I think we must bear in mind that the Venezuelan opposition is extremely divided, uh, as we have said in the past. So uh, today there seems to be no, if you will, central command. There seems to be no uh, coherent strategy. And those within the opposition that are close to Guaido, but that are you know, politically moderates, uh, seem to be you know, tempting, uh, you know, giving some opportunity to, this, uh, to these talks or mediation efforts um, put forward by the government of Norway, and, and again, you know, if, if the other options have not worked, um, I think the the uh, hardliners' uh, authority to prevent that, uh, at least initial contacts from contacts from happening, uh, has diminished. So I think it's encouraging. Uh, it's a shame that we had to wait uh, this long while the situation in Venezuela was deteriorating by the day. Uh, because again, uh, the sanctions, economic sanctions, have, have uh, been escalating. You know, the U U.S. government has been imposing uh, sanctions in 2019 that have made the economic and social situation more dire inside Venezuela. So it's a shame we had to wait uh, these four months. But at the same time, it's encouraging that now uh, even Mr. Guaido, you know, has opened the door for these talks. Uh, and, and I wish again that this process will will uh, move forward. Tamir, um, I know that Oslo uh, negotiations or these preliminary discussions that are underway was a very closely guarded process. But what do we know so far about what actually happened in Oslo? Well, I think that we, we can only speculate because, you know, the characteristics of these talks is that they need to be very private. It's, uh, I, I frankly consider a shame that um, they were even made public. Uh, and it was again, you know, given the, the divisions within the Venezuelan opposition, one frustrated person uh, from the opposition uh, made, you know, a, a public statement basically leaking uh, the fact that there were being contacts in Oslo. Um, because again, there, there has been a uh, very negative rhetoric in the past coming, especially from the uh, opposition hardliners, accusing anyone uh, willing to engage in, you know, what is normal in, uh, in a political crisis, that is, that is contacts, uh, um, talks uh, to come up with a solution, accusing them of uh, playing the game of what they call the Maduro regime, you know, because they have depicted uh, negotiations as a tactics from the government of Venezuela, from the government of President Maduro, uh, just a tactic to a tactic to win time, uh, to buy some time. So um, again, I, I, I think that um, uh, as long as these talks uh, remain private, um, this is a good, uh, you know, a positive, a, a, a positive element uh, for for the negotiation to move forward. What we, but, but what we know is that effectively two delegations were in Oslo, that uh, the Minister of Communications, Jorge Rodriguez, was there, that the uh, governor of Miranda, Mr. Hector Rodriguez, is supposed to have been there too, and from the opposition side, that Mr. Gerardo Blyde, who is a former mayor of a neighborhood, a important neighborhood of Caracas, uh, was there. Mr. Blyde has been a moderate historically uh, in the opposition is somebody who does not hold any official position today, but that is uh, consulted by by uh, by Mr. Guaido, and and again is is one of the elements within the opposition that has advocated in the past for a reasonable political solution to uh, to the crisis. So I think it's and the second you know second element that we know is that. Um, 
the uh, Norwegian government um, had separate meetings with the two delegations, that there was no you know, negotiation in itself, that this is a preliminary um, mediation and, and, and preliminary contacts, even to discuss, you know, it's a discussion and a discussion to discuss about the agenda and the, and the uh, confidence building uh, measures that, that need to be undertaken for, you know, undertaken, sorry, for a, a now an effective negotiation to happen. Now, Tamir, about a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, between 2017 and 2018, there were negotiations in the Dominican Republic mediated by Spain's former Prime Minister, Rodriguez Zapatero. Now, uh, these talks collapsed. Why did they collapse? And why would these current negotiations in Oslo have a better chance of succeeding um, as far as uh, you know, since we don't know very much about the Oslo process? Well, I think there were um, several reasons why the, uh, the negotiations of the Dominican Republic collapsed. Probably what, what has changed since, or, or, or one of the elements that one could point out is that it, precisely those talks were extremely public. Um, and, and the mediator's role was a very high-profile one. Um, the press, the uh, public opinion in Venezuela knew every time that Mr. Rodriguez Zapatero traveled to Venezuela, it was uh, in the news. Um, uh, on the other hand, the uh, discussions, the agenda, the delegations were extremely public. Again, every time those contacts happened. So, those contacts were under the tremendous pressure of not only Venezuelan uh, public opinion, uh, knowing that there is factions uh, in the opposition mainly, but also in, within Chavismo that are hostile to any type of contacts. Um, so these negotiations were not uh, protected enough, if you will. And, and on the other hand, they were also submitted to the pressures of the uh, of foreign governments, uh, you know, the, the government of Mr. Maduro claims that in January 2018, at the you know the end of these negotiations, a draft agreement uh, had been reached, you know, between the two delegations, and that it was uh, the pressure of the United States government that on on some of the factions of the opposition that uh, made it possible. The, uh, the agreement to be signed. On the other hand, there were also tensions within the uh, within the Venezuelan opposition. As you must know, part of that uh, negotiation was um, the uh, presidential elections that were to be held within 2018 or 2019. So there was the, this, the discussion on the calendar and the conditions for a presidential election that ended up happening in May 2018 without the participation of the main parties of the opposition as the agreement collapsed. But, but what I wanted to, uh, to underline was that there were also internal tensions within the opposition. Again, it's a very divided uh, opposition and they had to come up with a you know single candidate uh, to represent them all. So I, I think there were both political internal problems uh, and second, um, a, a two-part two -part, a framework that made uh, the pressure on the delegations and, and on the negotiation process too high. I think, again, it is positive that now uh, the government of Norway, a uh, specialized government that, 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 that has an, a, a, a very um, extensive experience in this type of uh, um, difficult situations and, and, and high tension negotiations. I think it's positive that uh, this time uh, the talks, the mediation, the efforts are much more discreet and, and kept out of the, uh, again, the public opinion's pressure. Tamia, let's just leave it there for the moment and come back uh, to continue our conversation.